Hello and welcome to Direct Approach with Wayne Moorhead, an exclusive podcast by DSN where Wayne shares candid and insightful conversations with leading corporate executives about today's evolving direct sales channel. In this episode, Wayne sits down with Rolf Sorg, founder and CEO of PM International. Rolf began his career in direct selling while working at a car dealership. And after becoming a top earner, he founded PM International. His perseverance and determination paid off, and PM International today is ranked eighth on the DSN Global 100 list with $2.55 billion in annual revenue for 2022 and operating in 45 countries. The PM International story is incredible with an unprecedented 29 years of continued growth in the direct selling space. At the recent DSN Global Celebration event, Rolf was awarded DSN's coveted Bravo Leadership Award, and PM International also won the Bravo International Growth Award for the third consecutive year. In this episode, Rolf shares his journey to success in direct selling and addresses some of the challenges that accompany rapid growth and how to navigate them. Before we dive into the interview, a word from one of our sponsors. Did you know that the average cost of one bad hire is nearly $15,000? By bringing 25 years of executive level experience in direct sales companies and speaking five languages, the CPN Krell Group knows what it looks like to have success in a diverse and international environment. Specializing in the beauty, wellness, and fashion industries, their omni-channel approach allows them to have access to a pool of candidates with experience in various channels beyond direct sales. The CP and Krell team leverage invaluable insight into what it takes to recruit top talent. And by promoting diversity, 92% of their candidates hired in the last 18 months had an ethnically diverse background, with 85% of them speaking at least two languages. Because landing a more sophisticated brand of talent takes a sophisticated recruiting partner. The CP and Krell group is your ideal partner to attract the industry's most substantial talent. Visit cpkrell.com. That is c p k r e l l dot com to learn more. The talent of tomorrow discovered today. Please welcome your host Wayne Moorhead and today's guest Rolf Sorg, founder and CEO of PM International. Hello and welcome to another episode of DSN's Direct Approach podcast. I am your host, Wayne Moorhead, and we are here today at DSU Spring 2023. We just finished the morning with a group of incredible CEOs, and I have the honor right now to sit down with another incredible and inspiring CEO, the founder and CEO of PM International, Rolf Sorg. Rolf, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So can you tell us a little bit about the path that led you into direct selling? Sure. I mean, okay, I will try to keep the story short. (laughs) (laughs) After uh, high school, um, I uh, did an apprenticeship as car mechanic. And that was because of my family background. My father had a company that was constructing conveyor belts, two sons. I'm the older one. And so he was planning that one will follow in his footsteps. And so he planned for me to study engineering and uh, as a first step to really get into that whole topic of uh, mechanic and, and have, knowing that I, I said I should do that at a later stage. So I did this apprenticeship. Um, during that time, I didn't stop in the evening working, but I also uh, repaired cars for family and friends. So I made some extra money. And then after the apprenticeship, I went to the university as part of the plan. And that was in a completely different place. So I couldn't do what I did before, uh, make that extra money in the evening repairing cars for family and friends. And so I had definitely a total drop in lifestyle. And I desperately looked for a solution to get back to that. And so that's when I ran into a mechanic who was driving my dream car, a BMW 3 Series convertible. And uh, he was telling me about direct sales. I've only seen my dream car and an option to get back to my lifestyle. And that pulled me in. Yeah, first uh, goal was to make an additional like $250 would have made for me as a student already a major difference. That's how I started in direct sales. So I worked as a distributor for five years. 
And uh, then that company I worked with made management mistakes and ran out of business. And that was a point that, uh, where I did need to take a, de a new decision for myself. In between, I was the number one distributor in this company, earned a lot of money. Luckily, didn't spend no, all of it, so I had savings and that I risked and started PM International in 1993. Well, that's an incredible story. I love any story about joining direct selling where a BMW is involved. Uh, <laughs> that is a great incentive to, to start a business and to yeah. jump into the industry. There, there have been um, other successful uh, founders and CEOs that have come in from the field as a distributor um, into starting their own company. What do you feel are the biggest advantages that you had in bringing with you that distributor mindset? Yeah, it was super important. I think it still is even today to understand both sides of the business. Because, you know, when, when I uh, started the company first, I made a lot of mistakes. What it was, there was also not only an upside and advantage, there was also a disadvantage because my behavior at first stage didn't change. So I was a grown up leader, you can say. And um, so I did what I did before. I was driving the sales. Yeah, but was not really careful about profit, liquidity. And uh, so we have not seen me too often inside the company, but mainly outside doing what I liked the best. What caused a lot of issues? Yeah, after four years, I had to look into the mirror and uh, think over how I move on from that because I didn't know that uh, if I don't change, uh, that's a dead end situation again. And uh, so that was a moment where I became an entrepreneur. So you can say, not first day, but four years later, when there was basically the point of that had to be decided to do things different. And okay, the advantage today is still to have that mindset of a distributor, to understand our distributors, to understand their needs, and also to have the practical experience myself on the other side. Okay, my role is a completely different today um, because I'm in charge of logistics, finances, controlling, uh, R&D, um, IT development. So basically you run all these different areas of the business and still inspire the people believing in the business and uh, having the strength to push the company forward even in difficult situations. So was the answer for you bringing in skill sets that would complement your kind of sales focus skill set or was it you digging in and really understanding um, those other aspects and functions in the business? I think it's extremely helpful when you run a network company to understand the distributor side of the business. I think it's one of the issues the industry often deals with that people are running the company and they don't having this practical experience. And so you get sold from our distributors that are great salespeople. They can sell you very good on theoretical things that at the end of the day will not work. No, absolutely. And you, yeah. you have the perspective and the empathy yeah. that probably many of us at corporate um, will never fully understand. So I think that's definitely a gift and a superpower as, yeah. as part of your leadership. And it definitely paid off. So the company has had an incredible track record of success, 29 consecutive years of growth. The last two years, you won the DSN Bravo Growth Award. Uh, again, it's an incredible example to all of us in, in the channel. What do you feel were the primary factors? If you can name you know, one, two, or three of the primary factors in that consecutive growth over the years. Okay, um, as the Americans would say, uh, taking the bull by the horns, mm -hmm. you cannot sit out the situation, you really need to analyze what's going wrong, not pointing on others, but first look in the mirror yourself. Um, having the wide shoulders to carry the load that uh, uh, is needed, it, it's also working your butt off. I mean, it's like a sports person, um, success doesn't come from alone, it's not falling down the sky. So um, you really need, some people approach me or occasionally people approach me and say, you're pretty lucky. And I said, yes, because I worked my butt off for it. Sure. So, and that's part of it. You know, the first three years, there was basically no weekend. It was 16 hours a day and there was no time for vacation. And you need to have that willingness uh, and the burning desire to go to all these challenges and to handle them uh, and not to give up and to stay consistent, stay focused, 
be disciplined yourself about what you're doing and uh, yeah and even in in in, uh, in the difficult times you need to be the, the I say the rock in the surf still inspiring the people still giving them the belief so for 29 years success story you need to be capable to handle crisis mm-hmm. uh, because there is a crisis coming along uh, it's not like it's, things are not going all the way up all the time so there there is challenges along the way and you have to deal with them and you have to to find the solutions if not it's not moving forward how have you found your ability to be that rock in the surf to to maintain kind of that probably calm direction maybe maybe you don't always feel calm on the inside but um, to project that to the rest of the company so that as times you know, do get rough or choppy um, that everybody knows to rally around and still move forward. Yeah, okay. It's, 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 I mean, it's all about your mindset. You need to be solution orientated. It's so easy to get stuck into the why yeah, and thinking about the problem only. You need to be capable to turn the switch to, to solution. And there's desperate moments. So there was often enough I was laying in bed and got sleepless nights or uh, so. And, and, but at the end of the day, if you're looking for a solution, you can find a solution. If you're looking for a problem, you will find a problem. So, and, sure. and that's that's what it is. And uh, yeah, no, that's really interesting. And I love what you said um, about luck. But yes, you know, there's the famous saying: the the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, and that's definitely true in business. So, what are some other factors that you feel have really helped to continue that growth? You know, over all of these years. I mean, to find and to grow leadership is a very imp- important factor. No question about that. I mean, I have an awesome team working together with me um, that develop itself over the time. And uh, I mean, so I mean, I could initiate certain things, but at the end, the outcome of what we're doing today is the outcome of what we're doing all together. Um, yeah, it's it's a team effort at the end of the day. And uh, it's just a great team that has grown and, and, and it's carrying that success on their shoulders. So does your kind of leadership development program, is it fairly formalized? Um, is it more just relationship building? How do you look at the task of building field leaders? Uh, okay, we have a clear leadership program. There's no question about it. So we help our distributors step by step by step. When they grow their business, they get also the education, the training along. And we take ownership and also uh, as a company uh, of that part, uh, we are involving our leaders as part of it. But it's really following uh, the career step by step by step up to the highest ranks. Yeah. And uh, it works. And how has that impacted retention and longevity with your field leaders? Do you have a lot of the same field leaders that you've had? Um, are you able to bring in kind of new co- cohorts periodically? Uh, so we have an important moment this year because we have our 30 years anniversary yeah, and I will proudly present our founder team on stage. And there is uh, leaders that are working with me from day one. And I have also on my corporate team people that uh, started, <laughs> once started as a as a worker and he's now uh, in the management board uh, of uh, our headquarters in Europe. And uh, I mean, I'm super proud to see that. I mean, really people working for a very long time with us. Uh, sure, there is new people coming on board, no question about it. We have new countries that we open up and when we open up new countries, normally there's also acquisition is part of starting new countries. So there's also new uh, leaders that get developed even from the company itself. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's all there. Yeah. I think that's an incredible testament to you as a leader and, and the vision that you create there that you've had so many of your field leaders, so much of your field that have stayed with you all of these years, 30 years. Again, congratulations. What an incredible accomplishment. I think it's just important um, for that kind of growth that you get that kind of commitment from your field. Yeah. No, absolutely. So speaking of that type of growth, so it took about 26 years for PM to reach the first billion Mm -hmm. and then only about two years to reach the second billion. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So most companies are going to be completely focused on just holding on for dear life, just trying to keep up with that level of growth. How do you balance meeting kind of the immediate needs of the day with also planning for the future and making sure 
that the company continues to grow and is continuing to be relevant on into the future. So first, uh, as you said, I mean, it took us 26 years to, to get to the first billion, and then it sounds clear, yeah, and then only two years to, to the second billion. It was an outcome of consistency. So we were never the fastest growing company, but we were an extremely consistent growing company, even in the big numbers. What is very helpful. On the other side, sure, the pace was high in the last couple of years for PM International. And uh, I mean, sure, there is a lot of challenges coming along the way when you grow so fast on that size. And there's always new challenges coming on board. Uh, but the only thing you can do is give your best and uh, have a team doing the same. <laughs> Again, look for the solution, go for it, work your butt off and uh, get the job done. I mean, it doesn't say that everything is perfect, sure. Um, sure. But okay, so far, so good. And usually the field understands when, when you're experiencing that level of growth, they give you uh, a little bit of grace in, in some of yeah. the ways the company operates. And uh, I think it's a strong sign of leadership if you also let them be part of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And if there's a challenge, yeah, in a positive way. So say, that's what it is. So I don't want to tell you any story. That's what it is. Uh, we will solve it. We give our best. No wrong promises, but always solution oriented and motivated and inspiring looking forward. So how do you bring them in? In, in times of crisis maybe, or, or in times of challenge, what are some of the ways that you bring the field in and, and help them to be, or let them be part of the solution? Okay, I mean, uh, as everybody, I mean, we're reaching out through uh, online and offline events. I mean, in there was a time where we had to do everything online, reaching out to them and if they uh, show leadership and activity at the same time, they can be even on a table with me in an open discussion. Now, a word from our sponsor. DSN is honored to be supported by industry suppliers that partner with companies across the channel to help enhance, streamline, and grow your businesses. This episode is sponsored by Infotrax. For 30 years, Infotrax has developed exceptional software solutions. Their cloud-based platform offers everything customers need for a successful compensation plan. Their commission calculator, web-based development portal, data subscriptions, commission management, health monitoring displays, and support team are here for you. You may have heard recently that Infotrax partnered with BigCommerce, a flexible software as a service platform to help you grow and convert more customers. BigCommerce equips you with fast scaling e-commerce success with e-commerce tools and customizable storefronts that fit your brand. And the user-friendly interface empowers you to make changes with clicks, not code, to improve productivity and reduce costs. Visit infotraxsys.com. That's I-N-F-O-T-R-A-X-S-Y-S.com to learn more. Now let's get back to the interview with Rolf Sorg, founder and CEO of PM International. So what do you feel were the greatest challenges during those periods of growth? What were the greatest challenges that the company faced? Uh, if you take the whole 29 years, so now we're shortly selling, shortly selling our 30 years anniversary in a couple of weeks, overcoming uh, the challenges. To how to handle a crisis, yeah? so whatever it is, what caused the crisis in the past or so the biggest challenge. Uh, I have to see greatest and jealous competitors trying to copy our products and uh, trying with massive action to steal distributors from us kept me a little bit busy. Change in law sometimes, yeah? there are things you can influence and other ones are just happening and you have no, uh, no time to plan for that mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you deal with it. But at the end of the day, it's really about turning the switch, looking for the solution um, and not giving up before you have it. And at the same time, be the rock and the surf to all the people, keep them strong on the belief and uh, drive the vision and uh, keep them inspired. So to that point about vision, you, you talked about some of the external factors and dynamics that, that are obviously challenges during growth. I'm curious, as you grow at that scale and at that rate, 
How do you keep the vision in front of all the new distributors and all the new employees? How do you make sure the culture remains what you want when you start reaching a scale like that? Staying focused and keeping the communication channels open, mm -hmm. <laughs> using all of them as good as you can to try to reach out to almost uh, everybody as direct as possible. And uh, okay, so that happens online and offline. You have all kinds of uh, ways to do that. You can use social media, you can uh, plan big event, you can do it hybrid by going online and offline at the same time. What we do today, I say that versus the stages, first everything was offline, then everything was online, now everything is hybrid. Mm -hmm. That's how we name it. Um, but at the end of the day, yes, you penetrate the message and try to go as direct as possible. So as the founder um, and as the CEO, how do you see your role in the culture and keeping that culture alive on, on kind of a day-to-day -day basis? What do you do to keep that going and kind of beating that trump? I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I have a huge team of people helping me. You know? And if you look to the sales side of the business, it's our chief sales officers and our sales directors in the countries. So, um, I mean, they have our vision, our um, culture in front of their face every day because it's pinned to the wall in each office on the world. That's great. So, <laughs> that's one thing they cannot ignore because it's right it's there. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> On top of that, they have me penetrating that message all the time. And uh, I think that's what you do, penetrate it. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of heart and pride and how it impacts the culture there? I think that's, that's uh, an extreme essential point. Um, uh, interestingly, I learned that um, from not from Levi Strauss himself, but from the CEO of the company on one of these events I joined. Um, uh, he brought it up and he said, okay, you know, if you can talk to the heart of the people and you can catch them with their pride, then you can turn the world around. Uh, so, and uh, I pinned it on my um, computer screen until I uh, was believing to myself that I understood the message and I delivered it too. No, that's interesting. <laughs> so, you know, you can motivate uh, distributors in the beginning to a certain degree with money. But at a point of time, that doesn't work anymore. And if you think that, look for athletes, how much they fight for recognition. Yeah, that whole system is built. And, and so... What is recognition about? It's an outcome of, you know, you're doing this with all your heart and all your pride. And so if you can use that as a method to motivate and inspire a distributor and find ways to, to do that, I think that's, that's a real magic. Yeah, it is. I love that you were using techniques to create belief in yourself as well. And, and till, till you absorbed, until you internalized um, different ideas and concepts that that even you as the founder uh, at times are, are kind of working to absorb these ideas so that you can then reflect them back out into the, the organization and the community. Can you talk a little bit about the role of standardization and then the role of innovation? Okay, innovation is the same. And I, lo I love talking about process with a German. So <laughs> I, I get the, the best in the world at it. So I, I want to hear about standardization. Um, uh, okay. Um, I think standardization, as bigger the company gets, as more important is to have standardized processes. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about standardization, it's also about efficiency. Uh, no, it, you can standardize things, but it's a way to be efficient. And uh, I would say the, the easiest way, I think, to explain is, is a look at the brand. Uh, you want to be visible as a brand at every place the same way. That makes your brand strong. So the same happens with processes are leading towards that. Yeah, so, so I think if you want to keep the overview in a growing business, especially when we are now we're global, just realized with opening New Zealand three weeks ago, the office that we now made it to the other end of the world because it's from the place I'm living, Luxembourg, the first place you can go. Oh, wow. So without standardizing processes, you, you get lost in space. I mean, that's definitely clear. So, so it's really important. Um, always keeping simplicity and uh, efficiency as part of the thinking process. So standardization alone is not doing it. 
Uh, it needs to be efficient and you need to keep things as simple as possible at the same time uh, as bigger your business becomes. And innovation is a driver of your business. It's essential. I think if you want to stay competitive, you have to be innovative. You have to have new innovations in place. And today we, we learned from uh, one of the companies that uh, was selling not products like we, our, our products are getting our consumer usable products, so nutrition supplements and cosmetics. Um, they're in a, in, in a different market. They're, they are selling products to the uh, customers that last for a long time. So if they would not be innovative, they would be out of business so fast. I mean, okay. And for us, it's the same. I mean, innovation is a driver. Yeah. So do you build that in? Do you, do you have a dedicated R&D department, an innovation department, or, or like a future have, department? We talk innovation on management level because innovation to me goes not just towards a product. It has to be all over. We are particip participating every year on a competition for an uh, innovation award. And I do it for a clear reason um, that it keeps our focus on this factor innovation and that we think it really broad so that we look from A to Z through the whole business and the whole company and into the future. What makes us competitive? What are we doing good? And what do we need to do better? And what do we need to do next yeah. to be competitive and to stay competitive? I love that you've been able to build both those disciplines of of standardization and innovation, because at times they can almost be competing with one another yeah. um, or, or at least have opposing forces. But yeah. but being able to have both of those, again, has allowed you to scale, but also allows you yeah. to, to remain relevant for the future. And uh, yes, I have an R&D R &D team. Sure, we have Great. own labs. Yeah. So we uh, do our own R&D in-house. We have our own patents and we have a clear USP work out. Amazing. So. 30 years in, if you can take a step back and, and, and look back and, and give your younger self, 30, year, 30 years ago self, some advice, what advice would you give? Okay. Ooh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, 30 years back, what advice would I give about what I should have done better than what I did? Uh, Always give your best and not uh, just do what you like the best. Success happens outside of comfort zones. So keep yourself out of the comfort zone and <laughs> your people too. Absolutely. It sounds like you spent 30 years outside of your, your comfort zone with, with growth and, and innovation. Yeah, interestingly, you can push yourself outside of comfort zones or it happens. Yeah, either way. It's gonna <laughs> influence either way. If you don't do it, yeah, either yeah. way. I think uh, I, I wish I could do it more on my own. I think I end up uh, being forced to get out of my comfort zones uh, more frequently. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about today and is obviously a huge theme here at DSU is the dramatic changes that are happening in direct selling all across the landscape. Yeah. What are some of the major changes or shifts that you're seeing in the chat? Okay. I mean, there's tons of things coming along. I mean, what I see importantly is that... Uh, so it's, it's the pace is picking up. It's getting faster and faster and faster. So you have so many changes going on. Let's say is it, we just talked about uh, this period of uh, when we had to deal with COVID, um, where people were locked away, and then we went purely into online. Digitalization became so super important to adapt to the new circumstances. Then you had this time again out of COVID, where uh, we're looking for the new normal. Um, what just bringing up hybrid, then social media is picking up, influencer marketing is a big deal now. Uh, if you, affiliate is a strong story talked about right now. How can you use AI and implement it to what you're doing in a, in a sensible and ethical way? Um, there's a lot of opportunities on the table and they're kicking in extremely fast. And so as it's the, the chance and the, the risk is always very cl close next to each other, but the pace is getting faster and faster. And so, I mean, the only opportunity to stay competitive is to keep up with that pace. It would be really easy to chase a lot of these new platforms, a lot of these new technologies, um, a lot of the other ways of, of doing business. We were talking this morning with some companies that have changed compensation models or become more affiliate driven. 
So in this kind of state of, of ever-changing dynamics, what's the role of the basics in network marketing? I mean, I absolutely believe uh, in network marketing today, and I see a bright future for network marketing. I see it as a challenge is getting bigger and bigger at the same time because pace is picking up and you need to seize the opportunities. The so chance is coming along. I'm not a friend of uh, changing things. I think fixing, refine, and developing is a better way to look at it. So where you, often it's little tweaks you have to do, or you don't need to change everything and re redefine everything or putting everything in question. Yeah. Um, and uh, the human factors, as I think it was pretty clear in the talks today, plays an extreme big role. Um, communication is a trigger, and um, so to be social, staying in communication, um, selling through emotions, I think is one of, of, of the strengths of uh, network marketing. And that's also the future in direct sales, especially with these huge risks they see about yeah, how important is a human being in the future, mm -hmm. talking about all these AI discussions going on right now. Yeah, the emotional factor and the trust factor for, that's given from one to the other person, that's not replaceable. No. I mean, that's there. And that's where there is a clear reason for direct sales and a bright future. If you use all these tools and opportunities that are there, implement them, solution oriented, not forgetting what the base of the business is. It's your customer, and the customer trusts the person that introduces a product to him, and it's a trust and emotion based decision that's taken that will not be replaced by a computer. No, I think that's so powerful that, that you talked about the importance of emotion, especially in today's kind of D2C, you know, one-click world. We're so focused on the transactional that the emotional often gets lost. Yes. I think that's a really yes. great insight. And again, that's one of the things that we in direct selling uh, can bring, that relationship yeah. to the sale, to the relationship, yeah. um, to that yeah. customer acquisition process. And I think what was also very clear today was that people want to connect. You know, this socializing. Yeah, so this, we had it heard several times today from CEOs that they want to get back to the table. Yes, yeah, they want to meet yeah. each other, and that's what we see, or what I see too in our company is exactly the same. You know, it's, sure, it will not be as it was because exact things are developing to a new normal. So you have online events still. You have hybrid events where you have partially people online and other ones are just live there. And then you have some events where everybody wants to get together. For example, when we have a celebration going on. So that's where people... Uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, also a key factor for a reason that direct sales is, is an opportunity for today and for the future. Agree. And I think in today's world where it's increasingly virtual and digital, those in person, we're learning. You know, we thought we had this magic bullet of now everything can be virtual. We don't have the same costs with events. We can do everything through Zoom. And we realize that we just can't do that, that, that it does not have the same impact. It does not have the same longevity yeah. um, as simply digital. But that hybrid approach is really important. Yeah, here's a, that's a point, but I say yeah. fix and refines, um, don't change, but develop. Yeah. yeah. So develop to the new future, and the new future is not like replacing everything that was right in the past. Sure. So and that's also not forgetting about the basics, what the business is built on. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a, a really great, um, a really great almost warning for us that in, in today's world of, of hyper change, that we could lean into beyond incremental change, almost go revolution where we should just go these incremental evolutions. Yeah and move uh, at a more steady pace, which again, I think, um, you know, your, your company has definitely proven works. So not only are technology um, and platforms changing, but people are changing as well. Distributors today are not exactly the same as, as distributors of five, 10, you know, 15 years ago. What are some of the things that you and your company are doing to attract and be relevant to today's distributors? Um. Yep, I mean, <laughs> thinking about their needs, having the focus on them, uh, and, and and delivering to their needs, I think is a is a trigger. It's a key element here. So yes, they, uh, they, they are, it may have changed a little bit 
to the past. I mean, as technology offered new opportunities, you know, working from home is a big uh, part of that story that came along uh, through the last couple of years or being completely flexible and from where on when I work, sends a risk factor, not facing any risk when I start something. But again, it's not like everything changed completely. It's, uh, uh, I mean, we had the topic of recruiting. We're really not facing an issue in recruiting numbers uh, in, in PM International at that point of time. And there were some other companies, and, and they basically brought it back. If you, if you have your focus also on the basic elements of of what worked in the past and built your business, and you, you're, you're penetrating your distributorship with that message and uh, uh, help them, it's working. So looking at the next three to five years, what excites you most about being in the direct selling business? The opportunity as yes, in the past. No, I'm a strong believer in direct Still, sales. Still as important <laughs> as it's ever so been. It's not changing. I mean, I see we give so much value to people. I mean, see, okay, we have an impact to life quality with our products to the people and we have an, an impact to their life standard with our business opportunity and that doesn't change and it's there. And then, I mean, it's faster, it's um, the opportunity is even stronger as it ever was because of all the technologies that helps you to build even faster than in the past and to create income all over the world without any barriers. So you can Today, you can drive a business global um, even from home. Yeah. Um, okay, if you're with the right company. But uh, yeah, the opportunity is awesome. So last question. If there are some direct selling CEOs or executives out there at companies that, that might be struggling with growth at the time, um, or maybe the, the playbook that they've normally been running isn't quite working, what advice would you give for them on how to continue to grow and succeed after 30 years of, of growth for you? Okay, I mean, it's, it's always, if, if things are not working for yourselves, then look uh, what's working. I mean, and uh, there's, there's people... I mean, and CEOs here um, that are open to share their success, that are succeeding right now, growing their business, being successful. And uh, so learning from them, uh, if you're not ignorant, but open uh, and uh, willing to learn still. And yeah. I think it's, it's, it's fixed and refined as usual. You need to look what you need to do to be competitive and stay in business and uh, move on. Um, I believe that uh, your business will, you will only lose your business if you give up first. Very inspiring words. And I love the idea of doubling down on, on what's working and not making those drastic changes, but those incremental improvements over time, they have a huge multiplier effect over the long term. Ralph, congratulations on all of your success. Thank you so much for the example that you're continuing to set for, for all of us in direct selling. Uh, and we wish you a very happy 30 years in business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Please take a minute to give a rating and review to help Direct Approach continue to provide these candid conversations designed for direct selling corporate executives. Thank you for listening and supporting DSN and the Direct Approach podcast.